Shankar, Professor Watat, Professor Dar. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the time you took to read the book, and I very much appreciate your commentary, especially Professor Watat, the criticisms that you raised, which I agree with completely. They're very, very important. Um, hopefully, Rutledge will allow me to write a second edition, and I will incorporate your comments. Um, and thank you to David Shore and the Berg Institute for organizing this. Um, um, so I'll continue in English. Um, I want to address a couple of the wonderful points that were made and expand upon them a little bit. Um, yes, if a magical third party, whether the facade of neutrality as we saw in Lofgren or a truly neutral third party, Japanese, Korean, somebody could arrive here and really adjudicate in a neutral way the various issues. Would that be the end of the story? Probably not. Because the closest that we came to it, in fact, was the second trial, the Lofgren Commission, uh, which held a trial that lasted for one month here in Jerusalem. As we heard, Mordechai Eliash uh, acted as the lawyer for the Jewish side, the Muslim side represented by Aoni Be'al Bukhadi and a, a range of other uh, Muslim advocates. Um, and at the end of the day, the commission issued a verdict that largely embraced the status quo, the principle of the status quo, meaning the Jews could do that which the Ottomans, the Turks, allowed them to do at the Kotel for centuries, nothing more nothing less. And that verdict was codified um, in a British bordering council in 1931. And really, between 1931 and 1948, there was relative peace and quiet at the wall. Both sides were unhappy with the outcome of the Lofgren trial. The Jews wanted an international court to acknowledge that the Jews had some right to pray at the wall that the Jews could blow the shofar and no kippur. And the court said, no, you couldn't do that in Turkish times, and you can't do that today. The uh, Muslim side, on the other hand, were unhappy because they wanted the court to declare as a matter of law that the Jews could only pay a visit to the Kotel, the same as any tourist coming from overseas but could not pray, could not engage in any kind of ritualistic uh, behavior at the wall, much like we see in force today at, on top of the Harbait, at the Haram al-Sharif. So both sides were unhappy, but the fact that both sides were unhappy led to relative peace and quiet at the wall for the next 17 years. The British government in Palestine only brought one case in those years, in those 16, 17 years, for violating the status quo at the Kotel. That was a case against a 17-year-old person, young man, who was accused of blowing the shofar at the wall. That was against the law. The status quo was the law. And the case was dismissed. It was thrown out by the judge. Why? Because the law only prohibited Jews from, from blowing the shofar at the wall, and the prosecution forgot to prove that the defendant was a Jew. <laughs> so the judge threw the case out. Very interesting. Um, in addition to this idea of maybe some kind of neutral third party could bring a small measure of peace, I think it's also very important, and I, I think the three of you made the points as well, that we simply are not going to be able to litigate our way to a successful outcome. What is required instead is creativity and statecraft. Lawyers like me, the other lawyers in the room, we're here to write the contracts, to contractualize the piece, but it requires diplomacy, it requires statecraft and creativity. And one of the examples of creativity that I mentioned in the book is something that quite astonished me when I discovered this in my research in the British National Archives. The Hebron massacre occurred on the 24th of August, 1929, following a week of terrible violence in uh, Jerusalem and elsewhere in the country. 
On the 26th of August, 1929, two days later, a very prominent Egyptian Jew from Alexandria, the Baron Felix de Menasse, walked into the British Embassy in Paris and met with the British ambassador in Paris, gave him a letter uh, proposing that Britain should allow the Jews to buy the Mugrabi area of homes that came all the way up to the Kotel. Three days after that, on the 29th of August, 1929, a different Egyptian, the prince, Muhammad Ali Pasha, the uncle of the future King Farouk, but at that time, Ali Pasha thought he was going to be the king. Three days after Menasseh's visit to the uh, British Embassy in Paris, uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha was on holiday in Istanbul, and he walked into the British Embassy in Istanbul and met with the ambassador and gave the ambassador a letter. The letter offered, on behalf of the Arabs, to sell the Kotel to the Jews for 100,000 British pounds. This is the only, I believe, known offer from the Arab side to sell the Kotel. The Jews had made many attempts to buy the Mogherbi area, to buy the pavement in front of the wall, to maybe even buy the wall itself, but never, never had anyone from the Arab side offered to sell the Kotel. The British ambassador in Istanbul was taken aback. Uh, Ali Pasha asked him to forward the letter to the High Commissioner in Jerusalem, John Chancellor. The British ambassador instead sent the letter directly to the Foreign Office in London. They looked at it, they said, this is crazy. He's the Prince of Egypt, he can't speak for the Jerusalem Arabs. In any event, they would never, ever agree to sell the Kotel to the Jews. So they folded the letter up, they put it back in the envelope, along with the Prince's calling card. And it sat there for 90 years in the files of the Colonial Office in the British National Archives. When I found it buried in the middle of a, a gigantic folder, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I checked with some people in this university and in the Hebrew University. No one had ever heard about this. And I thought that was an amazing example of creativity coming from the, from the Arab side. Um, and I'll make just one more comment in the interest of time. Um, I think that um, it is very interesting, uh, Professor Wattai, to compare, as you say, the, the uh, similarities and the differences between arguments that were made 100 years ago. This year, of course, is the 100th anniversary of the mandate. To compare arguments made then to today, and yes, there is a direct line between some, but you're exactly right. There is a very broken line between others. Two examples I would mention. One, uh, in the Lofgren Commission trial, in his closing argument to the commission, Mordechai Eliash, on behalf of the Jews, stood up and said to the Swedish, the Swiss, and the Dutch judges representing the international community, he said, I have said time and time again that we, the Jews, are not claiming any ownership of the Kotel. Now, can you imagine today can you imagine today a prominent Israeli lawyer or politician saying that? Now he went on to say, he went on to say, nobody owns it. Nobody owns it. It is a thing that cannot be owned. On the Palestinian Arab side, and you're exactly right, Antonius, Christian, and many, many others, um, uh, many of the Palestinian witnesses in the Shaw Commission, in the Lofgren Commission, and in the Peel Commission, repeatedly testified under oath, under oath, that there was no such place as Palestine. There was no such entity as Palestine. Under the Ottoman Empire, there was no Vilayat of Palestine. There was no Sanjak of Palestine. There was no Mustafaris of, uh, Mustafari of, of Palestine. And these witnesses, including Abu Khadi, including Jamal Husseini, including the Mufti himself, testified that Palestine was an artificial entity that actually was part of Syria and should be known as Southern Syria. And I don't think any member of the PA, PLO, Hamas would ever say anything like that today. So some of the arguments are the same, some of them are different, they've evolved over time. But again, the final point is that 
and the irony here is that although both sides have gone to great lengths to entangle legal and extra-legal concepts, to entangle law and politics, to frame the conflict, to cast the conflict in legal language, justice, injustice, victims, victimization, rights, wrongs, remedies, both sides have, have, have really tried to reframe the conflict as a, as a conflict involving legal rights and legal obligations. The irony is that we cannot rely on the law to bring this to an end. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you.